It is Tuesday morning and I'm doing Let's Chat on Tuesday this week because I'm going away tomorrow. But I just want to say to you, God bless you. Welcome. And I pray for just the most incredible sense of the brooding of the Holy Spirit over you today as I share with you what God has laid on my heart and as you drink deep, draw deep, and let the Holy Spirit inspire you to truth and, and righteousness, to revelation, to knowledge. Let the seven spirits before the throne brood over you as I've prayed that they will be brooding over me today. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of revelation, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of might and the fear of the Lord. God bless you, friends, as we dig into the word today. I want to say to you, this is a Bible study. I'm going to invite you to get a notebook and a Bible and to check with me as I quote and say things to you. And I may do this teaching over more than one week because there's a lot to teach. Please do not get bored. Do not get frustrated. This is an information and equipping for revelation. When I was asking God and praying about the year that lies ahead, God spoke to me about Matthew 24. I mentioned the prophetic word last week, and now I'm going to unpack it as to what God wants us to know and what he wants us to see. The disciples were talking to Jesus. They were walking with him. They were sitting together, and they asked him, when will this happen? Talking about the end of time. And what will be the signs of you coming and the end of the age? So when Jesus answered them, he answered that specific question. And we read about the answer in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. And I want to invite you to go and read Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. Because it will give you great revelation of the times we're living in and what is happening in our world and the signs of Jesus coming back. And so when I was praying, God said this to me. Matthew 24, verse 36 to 38, he it jumped out at me and he highlighted because I heard audibly in my spirit, as in the days of Noah, it says in Matthew 24, no one knows when that day or hour will be, but not the angels in heaven, nor the son of man, but only the father, because just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be. When the Son of Man comes, in those days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage right up until the day that Noah went into the ark. So friends, he was saying life would go on as usual. But he mentioned specific things, eating, drinking, marrying. Do you know that all three of those things are flesh-feeding satisfactions? That's what they will be doing. Okay, what does the warning mean to us today? Who is Jesus speaking to and about? Who are we, what are we to learn from it now? Who was Noah? What was happening in those days? What were the people doing? <clears throat> and how were they living? Why were things the way they were? And how are we living that refers to those days in the same way? Those are the questions that I ask myself, friends, and those are the questions I ask the Lord. And so God said to me, well, there's two things to focus in on. There is Noah, a man born of the bloodline of God, and the people, those that were lost and would, were lost in the flood, and that he had to wipe off to start again. Now, friends, we are standing in a place again where there are the righteousness of God and the righteous, and then a people that are ungodly that are going to be wiped away, just exactly in the same fashion. Now, what did God ask Noah to do? Now, we need to have a look at what the Word says. And I want to say to you, this is a Bible study. I'm going to dig deep into the Word today because I'm not giving you my impression. I'm not giving you my opinion. And I'm definitely not just taking stuff that I've heard and repeating it. I'm giving you a Bible study. The first thing we need to understand when we look at the word, what led up to the day of Noah? What was happening? So as we look at the word, I want you to realize that God created angels and living creatures before he created earth. 
and everything about the angelic realm was created to worship him to serve him they were his servants they were made for the task your car is made to get you from a to b it is not made to master you it is not made to be able to tell you what to do how to live and where to go it has a specific function and it's exactly the same the creatures and eagle and angels were made in exactly the same purpose and plan then god created the world and finally he created adam and eve he created the world he created the animals he created the birds and everything else and then he created man now angels were living creatures they were spirits they were the servants of god they had different sizes different positions different authorities different abilities and completely different responsibilities depending on what they were created to do angels fulfill a function i want you to understand that very clearly now the first thing i want you to know is they do not have flesh they are spirits breaths or winds and that is described in psalm 101 verse 1 they can sing and they can worship and if you read ezekiel and you read revelations especially it will see the angels cry holy 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 and they were singing before the lord they respond to god's biddings and they establish his word psalm 103 verse 20 where the word of god is spoken it releases angels to go and can be commissioned and establish that word and they will not stop until that word has been established they respond to what is the word of god not the word of people the word of god within the speech of people is what they will respond to some were created for glory and they never ever leave the lord's presence they are always around the father in the glory ezekiel 1 3 tells us about that they are sent to serve the sons of god they have been sent to serve those that are following in the ways and the things of god hebrews 1 14 they can speak they can converse they can listen to god and to man luke 1 verse 19 they can eat and they can drink psalm 78 verse 25 and we see that when angels came many times in the old testament they sat down and they partook of the food that was given they can Im they cannot imagine or create they were not made in the image of the creator please hear what i'm saying they cannot create and they cannot imagine they don't have that ability they can only listen speak and do what they've been told to do and only man was given the ability made in the image and likeness of god to be able to not only look like god but to be able to think to imagine to create genesis 1 verse 27 and 28 they have different purposes according to their function they will never cross over and do each other's work we see the glory angels the cherubim are in the glory crowd described fully in ezekiel 10. we see the fire angels the seraphim are in the glory and then can be sent to earth to touch and to do what god told them to do with fire and go back isaiah 6. There are guardian and protecting angels. Psalm 91 verse 1. There are armies of angels. And we know that Michael is the prince or the archangel in charge of the armies or the hosts of God's angels. There are messenger angels. And that you can read about in Psalm 46 verse 7. There are messenger angels. Gabriel was the lead, the, the prince, the, the archangel that, that is in charge of all the messenger angels and we read him coming many many times throughout from genesis to revelations including coming to mary they are eternal beings they are not mortal they do not have flesh 
they do not die. <clears throat> Only mortality came into this world when Adam and Eve sinned. It was the first time that anything was brought to an end with a limited period of life. Before that, everything that God had created was created to live forever. It had a beginning point, but it had no end point. They do not have a physical body. They do not have flesh, but they can take on the appearance of a person. And we read about that in Hebrews 13, verse 12. They cannot reproduce and they cannot marry because they do not have physical seed. Matthew 22, verse 33. That's very important to know, friends. They cannot multiply themselves. They do not have blood as they do not have a body. They are ancient beings that have been there since the beginning of time, since the day that they were created. Don't be impressed when someone says, oh, that's an ancient demon. Every single angel has the same beginning and they've all lived ever since they are all ancient beings they have been around since the very the very first time that they were created they have never increased or been replaced there are multitudes millions maybe even billions of angels and if you just look how many times hosts and the angels, and they looked up and they saw the angels, how many times it is mentioned how incredibly numerous they are. Now, the Bible says in Leviticus 17, 11 um, to, and 14, Deuteronomy 11, verse 23, that life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of a body is in the blood. So, friends, only beings that were created with a body have life. Now, I want to talk about the fall of Lucifer. Lucifer was a cherub, a glory angel. He was called perfectly beautiful. He was full of gemstones, diamonds, rubies. You call it whatever you like. It was part of who he was. It was part of his breastplate. And when he walked... He released musical sounds. He was music and he was this beautiful, incredibly glorious angel. His name was Lucifer, which means morning star. It means bright. He was beautiful. Now, he was in a position where he led all of the heavenly arm uh, angels into worship to the Father. He was positioned for that place. He was positioned in glory. He had this incredible, incredible privilege of being one of the angels, the cherubim. He was a cherubim that was in the glory with the Father, right at the at the uh, right at the throne room. Due to pride and wanting to be God, and also what I forgot to tell you is he was also endowed with wisdom. So there's an angel that was wise, that was positioned to leap into, into glory, to worship. He was beautiful. And somewhere that wisdom, instead of being used under, under the fullness of what it was intended for, he turned it toward himself. And he was proud. He was arrogant and he wanted to be God. Now, if you want to read more about the account of Lucifer, then please look at Ezekiel 28, verse 11 to 19. Now, Isaiah 14, verse 1 to 14 says this. How, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you have been thrown down to the ground. You who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mountain of the congregation in the far reaches of the north. 
Now, I want you to see that. He wants himself to be seen as superior again. He wants to take back his position, except he doesn't want to be worshipping God. He wants them to worship him. He wants to be back above the stars, and he wants to be, and that's talking about angelic beings. And he wants to sit on the mountain of the congregation. He wants to control the church. Why does he want to control the church? Well, I'll go on to talk about that just now. So his desire is to take all the glory back to him. But friends, he was cast down and he no longer has that position of authority. He has no authority. He has great power because everybody that fell out of the heavens and never lost what they were created to carry, he still carries music. He still carries gemstones, beauty. He is still beautiful. He is still incredibly attractive. And he carries great power. But his authority was removed from him. And he fell from the privilege of being able to sit in the glory of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And I will be like the most high. Oh, I've suddenly got an itchy nose. Excuse me. Now, Lucifer means, according to the Strong's Concordance and the B, uh, BDB definition, it means shining one, morning star. It comes from the word halal. And the word halal, which comes from halal, means the king of Babylon or Satan. So the very root of the, of the, the name that they describe the king of Babylon with or Satan with is taken from the word Lucifer. Now Jesus verifies and he said, I saw him fall in Luke 10 verse 13. Please forgive me. In Luke 10 verse 18. I trust that you are walking this journey with me and that's why I want you to write the scriptures down. Now when Lucifer fell, one third of the angelic beings fell with him and they are described as stars. Now, I want you to see that very often, excuse me, oh, very often throughout the word, angelic beings, angels, angelic creatures are described as stars. In Luke, um, Revelations 12, verse 4 and 5 tells us that they were the stars that were swept out when he fell. And then it goes on in verse 9 to say they were the angels. Now, fallen angels, who are the fallen angels? Well, they're the one-third of the angels that fell with Satan. Remember, they all carried on being able to operate exactly as they were created to be. A car can be a car no matter who owns it. It doesn't mean it's going to run to its best ability, but it can still be a car. They were fallen angels and spirit creatures operating under the domination and control of Lucifer. His kingdom is a kingdom of hatred, stealing, killing, and destroying. God's kingdom is love, peace, joy, building, multiplying, and increasing. They were under the control of Satan, Lucifer, which who was now called Satan, and doing whatever he told them to do. Satan was thrown out of the kingdom of God by Lucifer. I mean, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Satan was thrown out of the kingdom of God by Michael. God didn't throw him. God said, you're going to be thrown out. And Michael, the other archangel, the army angel, threw him out of the kingdom of God. And Jesus came to, to, to take away the, the, the false authority that he had stolen from Adam and Eve. But still, neither of them are involved in his destruction. I want you to understand that. Revelations 12, verse 4 and 5. Now, and then Revelations 12, verse 7. Michael, the warrior angel. Now, the prince of darkness, it tells us that in Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 5. You used to be dead because of your transgressions and sins that you practiced when you walked accor accordingly to the course of this world 
according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So he was um, thrown out of the heavenly realms and he became the prince of the power of the air. The air means the atmospheric regions and the power means the mastery, the magistrates of the atmospheric regions. So suddenly his power was established in the atmospheric regions and everybody that is not serving God comes under that influence and follows him. And who is he? He's a fallen cherub who wants back the glory. But he is a deceiver and he has lost all authority. I'm, I'm, I'm plotting this out for you to see something. Satan was created as a glory angel, but he lost that authority. The fallen angels that fell with him kept the same abilities that they had before, but they were now no longer operating in glory, but they were operating in the demonic atmospheres. And Ephesians 6 verse 2 tells us what they were doing. There were princes or principalities, which means they are princes over countries. There are rulers or demonic judges who are over areas and bloodlines. They are the rulers of darkness of this age, which are mind attacking and controlling demons that establish strongholds and fortresses in people's minds. And rulers of darkness of this age, which are demonic bombarding little demons that bombard the atmosphere and turn it chaotic. Now, the lifeblood is the life of, of a being is in its blood. There's incredible power in blood. Right from the day that God created a physical human body, he created blood that was incredibly powerful. I want you to get a revelation of what is pumping inside of you, friends. That blood carries your DNA. It carries everything that is life. There's only one life giver, and that is the Father, the, the Elohim, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Elohim means multiple God. It is the Trinity working together that gives life. And the life inside every single thing that carries a body has power. Because the fallen angels do not have a physical body, they need one to have power on earth and to possess the earth. They crave the life of the body of the flesh to give them life and power. They are always looking for flesh to control and ultimately to take ownership over, whether it be human or animals. Now, I want you to see that angels have the ability of taking on the appearance of flesh. The Bible tells us that. And they're always looking for flesh to be able to find a habitation in so that they can control that being. And if they can find flesh, if they can to draw from the life of flesh, and then they can control the mind of flesh, they have the authority that that flesh was given. They find great satisfaction and go into a frenzy over the indulging of feeding the flesh and the lusts of the flesh. They love it if they can lure people into using this, this, this casing of life that we've been put into and that the animals have been put into and draw it into sin. Because once they've done that, what have they done? They've taken captive. They have a way to go in. They've, they've, they've accepted, a, they've found a legal way to take control of that body. So they will work very, very hard at getting people to feed their flesh and the lusts of their flesh. It is a doorway into their lives if they can see and draw people into the indulgence and it makes it easy access. <coughs> for them to take control of that being. 
They are always looking for ways to lure people into indulging in the flesh and the emotions. They brood over those so that they can easily tempt them. The Bible says in James 4 verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee. Remember, one of the types of demons come to attack your mind. That's their whole function, their purpose and their plan. They continue luring, tempting and enticing earthing, earthly beings like Satan did to Eve. <coughs> Sorry, I'm talking a bit fast. Satan appear, appealed to Eve's mind, emotions and flesh. And that is exactly what they appeal to. They torment, they bring fear, they release depression and heaviness. They attack with suicidal thoughts and murderous thoughts. And they absolutely drive people into lustful behavior. Satan, the fallen Lucifer, is the force behind them. And he transforms himself and can manifest as anything. Now, I want you to understand this. Satan, the fallen cherub, who's described very clearly in Ezekiel, can also present himself as the angel of light. 2 Corinthians 1, 11 verse 14. But it says in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, he's like a roaring lion. So not only can he take on the personation of a, an angel, he can take on the persona of a person, he can take on the persona of an animal. Are you getting this with me? God gave the angels the ability to take on the persona to look like men. And that's why he said, be careful when you're entertaining um, strangers, you may be entertaining angels unawares. Now, Genesis 1 and 2, we see that after the fall of Satan, God created the world. He created the fish, the birds, the air, the animals. He created man. He established a garden for men for him to live in, to thrive in, to nourish him. A garden that was incredibly fruitful. In fact, it was an open portal of the paradise of heaven extending into earth as the gardens, the, the gardens of heaven coming and establishing in, into the, onto the earth. Adam and Eve were created in the image and likeness of God, as I've said to you already. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father being the supreme deity, the head, the creator. The Son being the supreme authority, the Lord, the King of kings. The Holy Spirit being the breath, the spirit, the fire of God. Now, the Holy Spirit only ever does the, 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 the fulfillment of what Jesus has commissioned him to do. And Jesus only ever does the fulfillment of the commissioning of the Father. So the breath of God goes and broods with the Creator, the Father, and the Son, the authority, has released it to go and do. So Father, the Creator, has released Creatoring into the whole of the Godhead. They all can create. There is creation within them. Genesis 1, 27 and 28 tells us, So God created mankind in his own image and likeness. He created them male and female. And then we know that he gave them dominion. Now, what does image mean? It means to look like and to resemble. What does likeness mean? It means to be like, to imagine, and to think. <clears throat> to be like him, to be family to him. Friends, God is a father, a father that has always been looking for family, to have a relationship with him, to fellowship with him, and to worship him. To carry his glory. To share his secrets with. He could never share his secrets before. He's been looking for family to share his secrets with. To multiply and to reproduce. Remember I told you angelic beings cannot multiply or reproduce. 
but human beings can. To rule the earth, to have dominion over everything that moves. Genesis 1, 27 and 28, and Genesis 1, verse 17 to 28. Now, these are all the qualities that Satan desperately craves. He needs what man can do. He hates God, therefore he hates anything that looks like God. That's why he's always trying to change people not to be happy with who they are and what they look like and take on some other image. He's trying to destroy the image of God in your life. Friends, I'm telling you, if you've always got to modify yourself to look like something else, you've fallen under a trap of Satan trying to transform and change the image of life. God created you just the way he wanted you to be. And we've got to absolutely fall in love with the image of God that is reproduced through us. Man replaced Lucifer in the glory. Man has had privileges and ability that's, that Lucifer never, ever, ever had, but that he desperately needs to fulfill his plan of becoming superior to all the other angels, to man, to everything else, even to God. He attempts and he drew Eve through emotions and flesh, and he took on, now listen to me, as much as he can take on the persona of a person, and he can take on and look like an, 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 a lion. He can look like a serpent. He can look like any flesh because he's trying to deceive. And we know that so many times people that are caught up in the demonic realm will say that their, their ancestor or their person came to visit them. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. What they're seeing is something taking on the appearance of that person. So he appeals to Eve, he draws, he touches, he, he links into her emotions. How does she feel? How does she think? How does she reason? And what does she need? And he lied to her by saying that, that God said to you, did God say you would die if you eat of this? Now, friends, death had never come into God's creation. She was immortal. Did God say you were done? Surely you will not die. You will become immortal if you eat of this. That was the lie that he said. And then he lured her with wisdom and appealed to her eye. And friends, we've got to understand nothing's ever changed. He still lies, deceives, he still tells you rubbish. And people are falling for the rubbish of the enemy all the time. And the scary thing is the church is falling for the rubbish of the enemy all the time. Now, the word serpent comes from the, the strongest concordance, H5175, so you can look it up, which comes from 5272, and it means a physical snake. It also means the image of a snake, and it also means myth, uh, uh, myth, mythology, anyway, myst in, the, in the mystics, the fleeing serpent. Mythological is the fleeing serpent, which comes from practicing divination, enchantment, and a magic spell. Well, that tells you everything. So he took on the image of a serpent in the spirit of enchantment and practicing divination. He used the flesh of a serpent for his purposes. Now, I want you to understand he could take on that impression or he could possess the serpent and then speak through the actual flesh because he has the ability to do both. Now, he deceives mankind by asking questions. What did God say to you? Did God really say that to you? Then offering them immortality and eternal life. Isn't that still the lie we believe in, friends? Then, appealing to the flesh of food. Then, appealing to the, to the eye by saying, look at this, look how wonderful it is. So, appealing to the flesh, appealing to the eye, appealing to the fear of death. And then to the mind, to make you wise, to give you wisdom. But friends, what wisdom could he offer? The wisdom that he was given that had now become the wisdom of the fallen world. 
By listening and eating, Satan opened the eyes of man to the demonic realm, but he shut them to the spirit realm. And we see the deception of Eve in Genesis 3. 1 John 2 verse 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. So all he had to do was steal her privilege of authority over the thing he wanted. He wanted her flesh. Now, lusts means the cravings, the desires, seeking for what is forbidden. Now, friends, the, the very reason that I am giving you this Bible study today is because seeking for that which God has forbidden is a lustful behavior. Seeking for that which God has forbidden is a lustful behavior. It gets you into agreement with the devil and he therefore has the right to totally deceive you. The eyes talks about the physical eye. Metaphorically, it talks about the eyes of the mind, the, the faculty of the mind. It talks about uh, the eye of envy, jealousy, and the eye of vision. So when people have envious and jealousy, they are seeing through the wrong eyes because it's also the place of vision. Your vision is going to be according to what your eyes are fixed on. Now, because they, respond, because they responded to him, Adam and Eve lost their position in Eden. They came into agreement with Satan and they gave him access to their spiritual eyes, to their mind, to their emotions and to their flesh. The, we know what happened. They immediately hid. They immediately went and covered themselves. That's always the evidence, friends, of, of, of sin. Hiding is always the evidence of sin. Jonathan, uh, Genesis 3 verse 3 says, do not eat of this or you will die. But we know they ate. Genesis 3 verse 14, the moment they partook of it, they entered death. Now, friends, it didn't mean they'll drop down dead. It meant that they would lose the ability to live forever, that their life would become mortal and have an end. The curse on Satan was this. Genesis 3 verse 14. You are cursed more than any other, any other animal or beast. Friends, Satan is cursed more than any other beast. That means he's dropped another level. Can you see that? He'd already dropped from being in the glory of God. He'd already dropped from being in charge of all the angels. Now he was, he'd been positioned himself as a, as a prince of darkness. But now even the beasts are superior to him. There would be enmity, which means hostility and hatred between your seed, a snake, and the seed of woman. Now, friends, this is what I want you to understand. This is not semen. This is not physical seed. Because spirits and breaths, angelic beings, do not have bodies. Therefore, they do not have lifeblood. Therefore, they do not have seed. Because life is not in them. They are servants. They do not have semen. No matter how much you go and lie on your car, you cannot reproduce little cars through you. It's not possible. It's not able. But what does the word seed mean? It means spiritually those who have the fruit, who think like and behave like their father. Physically, it means the offspring, the semen, the descendants. Who had the ability to manifest and multiply physically? Eve. Who had the ability to multiply and increase spiritually? 
Satan. Eve would have a physical descendants, and we go on from there to see who they were and what they looked like. She was thrown out. They were thrown out of the gardens of heaven. They were thrown into a place where they could no longer enter glory. But the amazing thing was God still came and spoke to them. He still came into their presence, but they couldn't just go into his. That was the difference. The difference was that there were times that he could draw them to him and speak to him and communicate with him. But there wasn't this freedom of all the time, any time, because they were living in, in an habitation with him. So they lost that position and they were thrown out of, 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 of the heavens. And they, were, they, they then ended up being in a place where God started multiplying them. So I'm going to look at that in a minute. But first, I want you to know this. What is the spiritual seed of Satan? Satan does not have flesh. He cannot reproduce semen. And he cannot reproduce physical children. But he can influence the atmosphere, as we've already seen. He can influence the de and deceive the control, the minds of people. He can control people. He can control their perception and their reasoning. And he can even control their bodies. And we see in James 1, verse 13 to 15, and I would like to just read this to you, please, because um, this gives you a little bit more insight on the way that Satan impregnates. It says, James 1, verse 13, Now when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil or the evil one, nor does he tempt anybody. But each, of one, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it goes forth to birth sin. So there is a conception, there's a pregnancy, and there's a birthing of what Satan's seed is. Then it goes on to say, uh, where did I miss it from? Yeah. And sin, when it is full grown, when the children of sin are full grown, it gives birth to death. So friends, there is a process of being conceived by Satan, of being impregnated, of being pregnant, of birthing and growing. Now Psalm 7 says, he who is pregnant with the evil one or evil, and conceives trouble, which means sorrow, trouble, confusion, gives birth to deception. James 1 verse 13 to 15 and Psalm 7 verse 14. So can he impregnate people? Yes. In their minds but not physically reproduce children through people. We have divine weapons to be able to stand against that. We read in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 to 6, but the Lord has given us divine power over the onslaught of the enemy. I'm paraphrasing. We can take our thoughts captive and we can bring them down and we can cast out that which is not of him to silence the strongholds, the fortresses, and to destroy them in the mind. So we have divine power. And then it goes on in Ephesians 2 verse um, 12 verse 18, sorry, in Ephesians 6 verse 12 to 18. I'm trying to concentrate on giving clear scripture, but my mind's also going ahead of, of what God wants to say. And he's told his disciples, Jesus told us who the, dis, the des, descendants of Satan were. So in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 to 6, we see that we have this divine authority and power. And Ephesians 6 verse 12 to 18, it tells us what the enemy can do. It tells us where he's living. And then it tells us how we come against him by wearing the armor of God. And every level of what the armor is. Most of it is for defense, but one is for attack. And the one that is for attack is the sword of the word, which is exactly what Jesus used. When the enemy came against his mind, he used word, 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 word to defend himself. Now, 
Jesus picks up again on the father of the descendants of Satan. John 8, verse 24, uh, John 8, verse 42 to 44. Jesus speaking to the Jewish leaders. Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would have loved me. And because I have come from the father, you belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out all the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and has never spoken truth since there is no truth in him whenever he tells a lie he speaks in the character because he is a liar and the father of all lies there's no truth in him he is a deceiver there's not one drop of truth that comes out of satan or the descendants of the seed of satan there are people blinded and deceived who follow the spirit of Satan because their minds have been taken captive. Now, friends, please see this. Where is the impregnation that comes from Satan? In our mind. What tools do we have? Divine, supernatural tools to protect our mind and to take our mind thoughts in control. And then it goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, that the God of this world has blinded the eyes. Well, we saw he did that with Eve. So that they cannot see the things of God. So there are blind people walking around deceived with strongholds in their head. And they cannot see the things of God. And when it's truth and when it is God, they reject it. And when it's falsehood, lies and deception, they follow it like hungry puppies. Because they want to feed themselves more and more on lies. I want you to understand this, and I know I've taken time, and I know that I've already spent three quarters of an hour explaining such foundational basics. But friends, if you do not understand what angels and the angelic realm are able to do, and you do not understand that they are spirit wind beings, fire beings, they have different authority, different responsibility, different abilities, that fallen angels, have a, they have power, friends. They have power. They're still positioned in the same places that they were created for. You've got to understand God never takes away that which he gives us in our character. He says he'll never ever take that away. But he does lift his anointing. He lifted his anointing of Satan. He's lifted his anointing of the fallen angels. They can no longer come into the presence of God. And they start revealing the image of those that are not spending time in glory. And they're getting uglier and uglier and uglier. And unfortunately, that's what happens to every human being when they don't spend time in glory. They get uglier and uglier. And you start seeing what is living inside of the person coming out of the person. If they're always angry, they always look angry, frown, and they incredibly have a harsh look. If they're bitter, then bitterness pours out of their mouth. They take on the image of what is operating inside of them. If they are worshipping demons, friends, they start looking like the demons that they worship. Why? Because what causes us to reflect the image and likeness of God in the fullness? Always being filled with his life and his glory, which continuously brings life to our life in our blood. I hope this is making sense to you, friends. Right. Now. The genealogy of Adam and Eve. I've just noticed that my computer's about to die. I'm so sorry. Oops. This is quite funny, really. Then my notes go flying. <laughs> I've had so much resistance. To try and bring this to you but i am i'm not allowing resistance to stop me i am speaking the truth today okay so satan fell third of the angels fell with them were they living in the atmospheres around us 
God creates this incredible paradise on heaven. He puts uh, on earth. He puts Adam and Eve into that glory carriers, glorified humans who live eternally. Satan wants what they've got. He lures them out of there. They lose their inheritance of, of immortality. They then become mortal beings. That's why they've come into death. They've come into agreement with death. Do you know what the greatest fear in every human being is still? The fear of death. Because the fear of death is the foundation to every other fear. Because we've always known that that is the enemy to what we should have had. So God said, well, I can no longer continue with that which is under the control of Satan. So he creates, he's, he separates Adam and Eve. He never stops working with Adam and Eve because remember, he's still wanting family. He's still wanting sons of God. So say, uh, uh, Adam impregnates Eve, and Eve has two children to continue the blessings of God, to continue the righteousness and the purity of God, to continue establishing a people and a nation that love him, that are family, that he can share secrets with, that he can have interaction with, that he can worship with, and he visits them. Well, of the two sons, of Cain and Abel, God found favor when he spent time with Abel and the sacrifices of Abel and what his time of worship with Abel. He found favor and Abel was carrying the favor of God. And what did it do? It brought anger into Cain. Genesis 4 verse 5 to 7. But the Lord did not look favorably favorably upon Cain and his offering when then Cain became very angry and depressed and the Lord asked Cain Cain why are you angry why are you depressed if what you do is right will you not be accepted so God very clearly says to Cain Cain you're doing something wrong here you're not coming into my presence with a heart of worship and giving me that which I want, a sacrifice of flesh. Friends, it's always been about a sacrifice of flesh. Come and lay down your life for my life that I can give you more. He just gathered some, some produce, fruit, vegetables and gave that to God. There was no sacrifice of flesh there, friends. But won't, if, won't you be accepted if you just do what is right? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Friends, sin is crouching at every one of our doors. Sin driven by Satan. Satan, the fallen evil wicked one is crouching at every one of our doors. We have to master him to do what God desires of us to do. Do you want to know why the enemy has never been taken out of the earth? Do you know why every one of us Christians have to continuously journey against this onslaught? Because we're learning to master evil. We're learning to rise up in our authority. We're learning to be who sons of God are. But Cain did not respond to that. He allowed his anger to grow where, friends? In his mind. He allowed depression to overwhelm him. Where does depression come from? The atmosphere from brooding on your own self-pity. And this is not fair. Look, this is not right. He chose not to do right. He did not deal with his heart, he did not repent, and he instead became incredibly arrogant, and he came into agreement with sin, and he plotted evil. Where does a murderous spirit come from? Kill, steal, and destroy. So Cain went and he murdered Abel, but he showed no, so no remorse, and in fact was arrogant when God came to meet him. Genesis 4 Verse 10 to 17, the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood 
Why was the blood crying? There's life in the blood. The body was dead, but the life was crying out for me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground. So now they'd already been driven from the garden of heaven. They'd already been driven from eternity. They were now living and they were producing and they were seeing flourishing. The ground was responding to them. The ground was still giving them what they needed. But now he says, you have been driven from the ground. The ground is no longer going to respond to you, which opened its mouth to receive the, your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops to you. So friends, wherever there is an agreement with sin, there's always a curse on the ground. There's always the, the barrenness. There's always a lack of abundance. There's always an inability to produce good yield. Why? Because Satan is barren. Because what he controls is barren. It cannot produce physical food. Only steel mentally. Then he goes on to say, You will be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod. I'm going to just talk about this for a little bit, and that's where I'm going to stop. And next week, I will carry on to Genesis 5. The curse Saint Cain placed himself under and his bloodline under as the punishment of sin is that he could no longer enter into the presence of God. Friends, the first human being that was created that was no longer able to enter into the presence of God was Cain and his descendants. The earth would not yield a fruit or a produce for Cain. That's why you see barrenness, you see, you see derelict, you see no fruitfulness. No longer was he going to be able to work and receive because that's what he said. He said, by your brow you'll work and you will receive. No longer could he do that. He would be a vagabond or a fugitive, a man that would not belong. Now, what does a fugitive mean? It means disturbed. <coughs> Where was he disturbed? He was disturbed in his mind. He was tormented. You will be disturbed. No longer peace. No longer a quiet mind. No longer being able to communicate with God. You will be disturbed. Adam and Eve could communicate with God. Abel could communicate with God. Cain could communicate with God until this moment. No more. You will wander up and down. You will be tossed about. It means you will have no peace. A vagabond means shaking of the head. It means pity. You'll feel sorry for yourself. And people will pity you. Terrible. That's terrible. Scorn. The scorn on your forehead. You will scorn at everything. When you meet somebody that's always grumbling, always groaning, always miserable, always negative. Look at the forehead. What are they carrying? The seed of Cain. You will wander aimlessly. You will have grief on you. So friends, what I want you to understand is this. People that have been positioned and placed under the curse. And I'm going to talk more about this in the future. And we were all under a curse before we came to Jesus. They are mentally being tormented all the time. Fear, anxiety, stress. What if? What if? Always expecting the worst. Onslaught on the mind. No peace. They do not belong. They're looking for a place to belong. They suffer from a, a, um, a spirit of rejection. They, he was rejected out of the presence of God. He did not belong to the family of God anymore. Wandering around, not belonging, not always looking for a place to belong. Blaming everybody else. You don't make me feel like I belong. There was this sense of, I don't belong anywhere. I'm lonely, I'm outcast, I've got a poverty spirit over me, nothing thrives, and I don't belong. 
I love watching near, near death experiences and people that have encountered heaven. And so many of them said, the moment that I entered into the heavens, I felt like I'd been here before. I felt like I'd come home and I felt like I belonged. That's what he lost, friends, when he came under the curse. The shaking of the head, wandering aimlessly, always trying to establish something, but it has no eternal value. The Oxford Dictionary says a vagabond is a person who wanders from place to place with no home to call his own. Now, James 3 verse 16 says, For uh, wherever there is any envy, selfish ambition, there is we will find disorder and every evil practice. What brought him to the evil practice? Envy and selfish ambition. Jealousy, envy, and selfish ambition. What was the result? A poverty spirit, a spirit of rejection, not belonging, not fruitful, nothing is happening, wandering around aimlessly, trying to make something happen, but not finding a purpose to life. What was the land of Nod? Nod was described as a desert, inhabited by ferocious beasts remember satan was cursed more than the beast he was under that and now the people of god were always being attacked by the beasts that were superior to them i find it very interesting that once again people are placing beasts and animals superior when god said it's the other way around you are in authority and control of them but satan was placed below them he was cursed more than them Augustine described it as a carnal, dis, disinquiet, disquieted attitude, which means a state of uneasiness and anxiety, always expecting the worst, always believing the worst, and always thinking that things are going to be bad. Fear is believing the things we cannot see are going to result bad. Faith is believing the things we cannot see are going to be good. It means commotion. Commotion in the head and everywhere they are, they cause commotion. You know those people that wherever they are, there's chaos. Wherever they are, there's arguments. Wherever they, they are, there's unease. Wherever they are, there's a commotion. And the opposite, people that bring in peace and bring in clarity and bring in just a sense of, oh, this makes sense. Oh, this is calm. This is quiet. Josephus wrote in the Antiquities of the Jews, in AD 93, Cain continued his wickedness in Nod. Violence, robbery transformed human culture from innocent to craftiness. He built a fortified city, walls to hide behind when the inheritance of Adam was ever increasing gardens in a spacious place. Now, the behavior of the fallen angels control the land of Nod, so to speak. The Wikipedia says that the land of Nod is the Babylon of Revelations and it's parallel to the land of Nod. So the land of Nod, that, that, that position that we're living in spiritually is the position of those that are under the control of Satan and the fallen angels. But those that are under the, 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 the influence and fellowship of the almighty God have life, life in abundance. They've got peace. They've got joy. They enter into glory. They may walk into these places, friends, and God allows us to do that because he wants you to master that. But the fruit of the promise of God in your life is fruitfulness. And the earth will yield up its fruit for you. Because that's what it does. You have authority and dominion over creation. But the trouble is the deceiver, the liar, has made you believe that creation has authority over you. Friends, I have to end there because the time is up. But I want to say to you, I wanted you to get a really good foundation of understanding of the limitations of Satan, angels, fallen angels, and created beings of the fact that the earth was divided between people that came into agreement with the fallen angels 
and lived under the curse. And those that could still walk hearing God, righteous men that still regularly had communication with God. Not the way we can do it today, but they would have visitations and they could come to God when God called them. I trust this has been helpful. I will carry on next from the birth of Seth, which was the, the, the promise of God to Adam and Eve. I'm still going to do what I said I would do. He gave them Seth. And the name Seth means compensation. I pray this has been interesting. And until we meet again next week, I love you. I pray that you will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. I pray that you will dig into the word and read it for yourself. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will give you the revelation you need for what God is saying in this hour. Thank you, Father, that I have been a sower of seed. Thank you that your seed will take forth, will grow, will cause people to think deeply. Father, we're living in a time where people are being deceived by the deceiver through what looks right all the time. We're living in a time where they're calling good evil and evil good. But there's only one truth. And as we drink deep from your word, I thank you that the, that the spirit of truth will permeate us and that will increase and grow our discernment that the spirit of deception and falsehood will not deceive us. I thank you for this in your beautiful, incredible, mighty name, Jesus. Amen.